outside. You're on the outside. Yes, he's back. Good. How are you doing? Doing great. It's been a long time since I've seen you. It, it has been a while. You know, 2020's kept us away from each other, you know. Well, it we has. We prefer just to catch up and grab some pizza. That's exactly right. And I think there's been so many changes because of COVID, you know. Yeah. How miserable. has it affected your business? Well, we've had to, we had to adapt and, and we had to change quickly, you know. So whenever we, whenever the shutdown did happen... We, um, as you know already, went into high gear and started doing some humanitarian work, which got us a lot of attention. It did. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, um, you know, a lot of people are like, that's pretty nice of you, or wow, that's this or that. But really, I was just triggered. My mom was a social worker during the AIDS pandemic, so that was how I was working through it, you know? And it was a, it was a pleasant byproduct to see people get helped as a result of me growing up in an atmosphere where I was integral in a, in a food bank. I knew how to do outreach work. I, I knew how to go out and find the people that needed help. So all that just fell into place and along with me being a tattooer and knowing cross-contamination, disinfection, and things like that, it really just felt to be in the right place at the right time to help the optimal amount of people that needed it. So, um, you know, the whole time while, you know, I'm, I'm pulling in 12 hour days and, and 30 to 40 calls every single day from people that were needing help. And my partner Shane was helping me with this and we we're just doing it until, um, society, until it diminished and society slowly started to open back up. Yeah. And then once all the smoke cleared, you know, um, we started getting calls from Reader's Digest, um, the Louisiana Public Broadcast the people at Louisiana Public Broadcast. Now yeah. this news. Here, let's see the Reader's Digest yeah. oh, so you can no. see it. Yeah, hold it up like so we can see you hold it. Yeah, it's so awesome. I mean, Reader's Digest, it's a national publication, you know? Yeah, um, so I, I, I had read, um, there we are. There you go, yeah. Nine million readers. Wow. Right, so I tallied up all the news agencies that did it. That so after this came out, many other stories started stemming from this publication, and people started contacting me. So something around 20 million people read "Red Head and Tattoo," Micah Harold, Shay McCormick, in the month of November and in December. That is amazing. It's it was pretty huge, but that wasn't anything that we could have anticipated. Right. Uh, but it did get Shreveport some much award some much awarded. Um, Na good national news, you know, when and you have... And we need some news, good news for Shreveport, don't we? so, we're in such a, a, a pit of despair right now. Nobody really knows how to handle it. And, um, you know, healthy choices aren't really on the menu for a lot of people right now when they're struggling with their own mental health. And, and you really get to see people act out in times as desperate as we had witnessed in 2020, right? That's right. So as a result, you know, Reader's Digest started focusing on people who were um, doing the humanitarian so emergency social work in their communities. And we got Shreveport on the list um, for one of the nicest places in America. Now, the way I recall it, it's something like 1,200 plus people were nominated. Then they narrowed it down to 200 and something. Um, and then they got one from each state, which was 50. And then they narrowed those down to six. And we were one of those six. And Oh, congratulations. I'm yeah. so happy for you. It, well, it was nice. Um, you know, to, to be frank with you, uh, in those situations where you're doing a lot of chair, when, you, when you're out in the community and you're on the street and you're talking to the people who have nothing to their name, abject poverty, um... The, the accolades weren't, they, it was like water off a duck's back right. because really in a way in order to do that type of work, I had to dis I disassociated quite a bit because when you're face to face with all these people who are hurting, how are you going to do your job most effectively if you're crying about it? So I really had to cut that off. I had to cut all the feels off and go straight into the, in, into the work, you know, and it really swept me up into this uh this new way of life for me, this hurricane for many months until, wow, ma society magically opens and everybody goes back from their Lord of the Rings savage behavior to, 
I'm sorry, Lord of the Flies, you know, when they're going all savage, everybody's returning back into this somewhat socialized construct, but the trauma's still there. It's still hard for a lot of people out there, so um, I've, continued, I've continued these types of efforts for the people that I see walking up and down the street and the people who we run across here. I think that's really great, and like you said, not for the accolades, but just to help people and lift people's spirits, and even though, you know, you may not want to brag about that or anything, I think someone reading Reader's Digest today would be like, you know what, there's some good in the world still. Right. And there's some good in Shreveport, Louisiana. It inspires people to do the same. Yes, exactly. Right. You know? And, and that, you know, that is what we saw when, when uh, the shops, were, all the shops were shut down and people couldn't get their sanitation and their teepee and stuff. You know, you, you didn't really see a lot of distress between um, people who are diametrically opposite of each, of each other on the political spectrum. What you really saw were, um, you saw good people rise to the surface to fill in a need for their community. And there were, not, there were no, no distinctions. There were no left or right, atheist, religious. We were all in it. Yeah, everybody's in the same situation. Yes! No matter if you're, you know, what walk of life you're in, what you're doing. And I think maybe one thing that would surprise people is all these community efforts are coming from a tattoo shop. It is unlikely, huh? But I think it's a, I think it's really refreshing that, you know, our local business owners are stepping up to really help out the community. That's and right. I think another thing that people don't realize about tattoo shops is how clean and sterile that you are. Mm -hmm. It's obsessive. It's borderline compulsive disorder. So not only that, um, not only do we have all the chemicals and the disinfection and the autoclave, uh, we have the education on bloodborne pathogens, first aid, CPR. Uh, we, really, we really have a hands-down approach to fighting disease because we have to keep ourselves safe and the people who come in here for tattoos safe. Right. Um, and, you know, looking back on the pandemic, I really felt it had been handled horribly wrong by incompetent state and federal leaders because what you, what you were looking at was you saw a, cl a lot of classism come into their decisions on what they kept open and what they didn't cut keep open so um you know if you were a, if you were a huge casino or a boardwalk or a corporate restaurant there were exceptions made for those people you could open but we saw tw uh, i forget the actual last time i read 20 percent of small businesses went bankrupt in that in that time and, um, you know, places that couldn't possibly accommodate the number of people that they were cramming into casinos, you know? So as a tattooer, I thought, well, this is stupid. You know, this is just, this is nepotism, this is cronyism, this is all those things. As a tattooer, we, we have to have batch numbers on our ink so that if someone gets sick, if I tattoo somebody... I'll have the batch numbers of all the colors that I used on them available to me and we can trace it back to the source. And that's really how I, I would have done it if it was my presidency. You know, pick your nine favorite people you want to hang out with. Most like-minded people who refuse to wear masks would be around other people who refuse to wear masks. Most people who were adamant about being around responsible people that were wearing masks and trying to cut down the spread of disease would be around those people and I just kind of saw the world as batch numbers yeah that would have been really easy to trace back to the source had the federal and state governments not been such crooks about the whole situation and I think a lot of people feel that way especially small business owners well when you read about Joe Austin and his mega church banking 4.4 million dollars of the loans that were specifically for small business mom and pop businesses across America, it's quite sickening how the opportunity was there for people to have a lot of money to make even more money, but at the cost of the working class and the lower class. So, Right, it's that old adage, the rich get richer. Yeah, indeed. Yep. Until those, you know, until the people at the bottom decide to do something about it. Yeah. And you see that cycle through, um, it, through history too, you know. Uh, it's very cyclical where you see power being cornered by a small group of people and then the lower classes bust up with their pitchforks or their guillotines and whatever and, and return it back to a, a, 
a society that's fair for the entirety. Or at least, you know, that's what we try to do when we're coming up with these new systems of government governance is to keep everybody in mind. Absolutely. And all the work you did to help people with COVID, and then you got COVID yourself. It was rough. When yeah. did that happen? Yeah. When did you first start? When did you first realize that it was COVID? I suspected it was COVID December 2nd. That's when I started having my first symptoms. It was a burn in the back of my throat. And I had two false negatives um, when I went in that night on the 2nd of December. And I went back on three days later because I got home and I was like, Ugh! and I fell on my bed. I didn't sit up. I didn't talk. I didn't eat, didn't drink water. All I did was lay there in like a very sick ball on my bed. And then on the fourth day, I popped right up and I was like, man, I'm really hungry. And uh, slammed some vegetable soup. Anyways, went back because I just was feeling awful. And that was my first chance to even stand up was on that fourth day. And I went straight back. And they tested me again, and I came up positive for both COVID and strep. It was quite the experience. And um, and then I lost one of my pet rats. Oh, no. Yeah, in the, about the, I guess it was about the seventh day, and I had all my COVID tears. Uh, I, I cried COVID tears all day, which relapsed me back into the symptoms, right? So I'm back I'm about two days in again. Of like no no food or water, and like too sick to stand up, like because of of the grief. I guess it stressed me out. I don't know. I was back in bed, but then the the ninth day, and I, I laugh about it now, but this this was in retrospect, it, it's it's a little funny. The ninth day, here I am, over the toilet, naked over the toilet, sweating, thinking, okay, I'm dry heaving. I go, this is it, because my body was just feeling so bad. I go, this is it. This is how I'm going to die alone on the bathroom floor naked. This is like the worst way. I was trying to avoid going out like Elvis. I wanted to avoid that scene, but look at me. Here I am. But in my typical Lieutenant Dan fashion, you know, I kind of like cursed God out, took some aspirin, and went to bed. And luckily I woke up the next day feeling a little better. So gradually I started getting a little better. A lot of people won't tell you this, but one to three percent of COVID patients do they end up getting um, conjunctivitis in both eyes. So I started getting eye problems, and um, that I I've still struggled with a little bit. Um, it's still lingering. We're hitting about almost the 40th day. So it's just got. But luckily, there's no permanent damage. I walked away from it mostly unscathed, but it is not nice, and I can totally see how unlike the flu it was no matter how many people you hear say it i was just going to ask you ignorant. what about the people say that say it's just the flu or just ignorant. like the flu i never i i wouldn't be able to draw a comparison between how the flu feels and how covid felt um because covid was just so awful and it just brings the worst out too people have reported their brains hurting and how can you even fathom your brain doesn't hurt it's not an organ but i felt my brain hurt I don't know how that works. It just felt like it was bubbling up and pressing up the sides against the intracranial walls. It was awful. People get rashes on their feet. People get ED. People get permanent liver damage and permanent heart damage, which was a big concern of mine because I have heart issues, you know, and permanent lung damage and respiratory issues for the rest of their life. You've had an eventful couple of years. Yeah. Let's talk about what happened with your heart. Yeah, so I was working out one day, and then... Um, uh, I fell over from pain in my chest, and I got rushed to the hospital. And the doctor says, Mr. Harold, we're making an incision into your leg. You're suffering from a life-threatening heart attack. And my whole life flashed before my eyes. I was like, what the hell did he just say? Like, he told me I'm about to die. I was walking around just fine an hour ago. No problems. No indication that I had anything wrong with me. And here I am in a, in a hot being rushed in an ambulance, spraying nitrous, uh, nitroglycerin underneath my tongue, running a gurney through the halls, that was me. And um, and then you were doing something healthy at the time that it happened. You are working out. I've been healthy for a yeah. few years, and I've been really pursuing it. But you know, with genetic heart disease, it, you could be doing everything right, and then bam, you're out of the picture. So I had 100% blockage in my LAD. 
and um, and I'm sitting there, and of course I'm not asking the doctors any questions because as a tattooer, when someone's like, oh, it's getting late, or oh, it hurts, or whatever, I'm like, yeah, if I can know, I'm a tattooer, you know, like, what do you expect, not to know this? So I didn't want to ask the doctor, if, hey doc, tell me straight, am I going to make it? Because I knew he wanted, he wants to keep me calm and he wouldn't tell me the truth if I wasn't going to make it, okay? So there's my logical mind going, going at work trying to figure out the scene here without really asking if I'm about to die. For one, I didn't want to look like a ninny even if I was about to die. I wasn't, you know, tell my kids I love them. I started cracking jokes. And then I realized how no one was laughing at my jokes and I'm a funny guy, you know? Um, you are. I, you have me laughing all the time, especially I, on Facebook since I haven't been able to see you in person. I'm like, oh, my God, it's just cracking me up. That's where I um, try to cut loose the yeah. most. But I was cutting loose on the, uh, even though I was in devastating pain. Um, so you and, felt like something was really serious when you're trying to crack jokes and they won't. Yeah. Yeah. No one's budging. Mm-hmm. They're just looking at me like I'm crazy. And then the lady comes up with this platter and says, Mr. Harold, here's your anesthesia. I said, ma'am. Is there narcotics in that? She's like, oh, yeah. I was like, well, you can keep it, please. I don't want it. And then she yelled at the doctor, patients refusing anesthesia. And everybody just looked at me for a second. You could hear all the machines, for a couple of seconds. And then they just get back to work. Thanks so much, Micah, for talking to me today. I really right? appreciate it. And I would give you a hug, but, you know, COVID, so air hugs. Air hugs, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Text messaging is the most immediate and effective way to communicate with customers. Syntex Solutions is the leading direct sales marketing company in the U.S., sending over 9 million text messages per month to 4 million subscribers. Contact Don Dare today at 318-272-7754 for an instant mobile connection with your audience that will generate the results you're looking for. Mention the show and get up to three months free. Syntex. Simple. Instant. Effective. Have you seen the latest edition of The Creative by J. Michael Photography? The Creative is a boutique magazine celebrating the lives and talent of Shreveport's thriving creative and artistic community. Through photography, experiences, and stories, The Creative inspires readers to embrace a diverse culture through common threads of art and community. Pick up your copy today at one of many locations, including Azalea Cleaners, Chicken Salad Chick, First Watch, Jaded Boutique, and Monjuni's.
everybody. Well, my name is Matt LaRue. I'm Lori LaRue. Jimmy Thompson. And Michael Wiley. We're the LaRue's in the back murder man. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So how did y'all get started? How long have you been doing music? Well, I've been singing my whole life. Um, beauty pageants and dance and uh, what do you want me to say? Like how long have you been playing? Uh, I've been playing for about 20 years. Uh, I met, actually met Lori when I was playing music. <clears throat> and uh, we reconnected about a year later. And she had a band and I had a band. And we kind of started hanging out. And my band split up, her band split up. So we decided to get together and play music together. Who were some of y'all's earlier influences? Or who did you listen to growing up that you said, Man, I want to sound like that or I want to be like that? Stevie Nicks, yeah, Martin. <laughs> yeah, girl. Uh, mine is actually way different. <laughs> so I played uh, a lot of rock and heavy metal music, and now I play country music, which is totally different. But <laughs> you know, uh, it is different, but in a way, like I can hear that rock influence. That's one of the things I was gonna say. I can hear that in your original songs, definitely that rock yeah, influence. Yeah, I, I definitely come from more of a rock background. Um, so there's all kind of different variations of country music. There's traditional, there's pop country, there's a little bit of, you know, outlaw country, southern rock, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, I just kind of lean more on the harder side of music, so I try to play thicker, kind of crunchier tunes, I guess, when I play. So, you know, I still like the the pretty fluffy stuff, but you know. I like the pretty fluffy stuff. <laughs> All girls like the pretty fluffy stuff. It's and romantic. Like nothing fluffy. wrong with that. Like <laughs> so like was, it, was it just the two of you for a while and then you added the other, well, everybody we, into the band? Well, we actually had Matt's brother, Adam, playing with us for a little while. And um, he decided he was going to go in the old field. And so me and Matt put the full band together the first time. And uh, this is our... We've had several people play Several people come through. Well, yeah. you know, like, they just kind of come and go. They all have various other projects. and. But we love our guys that we have now. Yeah. That's right. We love them. I think this is probably the best group out of all of them that we've had. Yeah. And super talented. And yeah. we're excited to have them here. Jamichael, what's your background? What do you... Um, so, I mean, I've been playing drums for maybe 10 or 15 years, something like that. Um... You know, same kind of thing. Uh, first band was a metal band. Uh, played in rock bands and uh, doing a, a lot of open mics, uh, you know, jazz gigs and stuff like that. So I try to mix it up, and now I'm here in a country band. Again, this is the second country band I played for. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your musical influence? Your yeah. I yeah, started Jimmy. when I was playing in high school guitar. Wasn't very good at it. And then I met my first wife and his, her father had a prison ministry and we went and play, set up and played in the prison, had church service. And the bass player didn't show up and he said, you know how to play the bass? I said, oh, a little. And here you are. There I am. <laughs> and then I quit playing for a long, about six years and then I got with Matt and I've been playing now for about a year or so. Well, y'all sound great together. So, and you have a new album out. Let's talk about we that. We do. Um, the album. What's it called? <laughs> it's just self-titled. It's the Yeah. 
Um, like a LA gumbo room. That's what we always say. Um, <laughs> that's like right. Very room. Louisiana. And Very then, Louisiana. You know, it uh, it started what was supposed to be the six month album <laughs> that turned into the two year album because of other projects that came along and life and. We had a really good friend of ours, um, Judy. Judy. And he came along, we met him. We, we recorded a couple of demo songs mm, about three years ago. Yeah, it's been a minute, it's been a minute. <laughs> and he, he did the demo songs We through a mutual friend, we met him. And um, we had another guy, he actually came out here to, to where we are now and recorded a song and I, I had Juvi do all the production and engineering on it. And um, after that, he was like, hey, man, I want to record an album for you guys. Um, I really believe in y'all, and I think y'all got a lot of talent and want to help get you guys to the next level. You know, do what I can to get you to the next level. And so he recorded an album for us. Um, yeah, it was probably supposed to take about six, yeah, seven months. Yeah, it was going to take six months and turn into years. You know, and then the pandemic happened. And the yeah. pandemic we had happened. lots of time. And so, so we, yeah. we wrapped we, it up we in actually May. We recorded the whole thing in this room. Yep. Um, first album ever. It was pretty cool though. You know, it's a it's a very learning experience. It was fun. Those. It it uh it brings a whole new level to your marriage. Oh of, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> you know, get up oh. nine o'clock in the morning. We're out here playing music and drinking a beer. You know, <laughs> and do it for couple of hours and that take off, run to come, work back, and come back that evening for a couple of hours, you know, so it was a long process. Writing with stuff. Matt was Writing an experience. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, so you write your own songs. I mean, like, we, what are your inspiration for, for your song or lyrics? Life. Life. Literally life. Every song on the album is an experience that either one yeah. of us have went through at some point in time in our lives. Um, it's so there's a song on the album, Perfect For Me. It was the first song I ever wrote. It was about we, my wife. We, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we. So we were on vacation years ago before our daughter was here. And I wrote the song and played it there. And... Here we are, yeah, Mary with the kid, you know, so brought I, home a souvenir I from had, vacation. I had a couple of, <laughs> a couple of songs when we started recording um but there was a writing process before that it probably took two or three months you know hmm. and i got a lot of help with that from from judy he came in and kind of helped me structure a lot of things um but ultimately me and Lori, we wrote every word to every everything that we had on the album and um yeah that's one thing like when i listen to your album it just sounds so authentic it just sounds like you it just feels like you poured your heart into this and soul into sounds this like album you live out in sticks no it's true you know and that, that's the thing like at the end of the day like these are all homegrown hardcore country music that is southern roots it's true to our hearts it's what we lived it's what we experienced it's, it's, it's us. There you go. It's us. Sounds good. You know, it's <laughs> us. <laughs> so if people want to listen to your album, how can we find it? We are on all musical platforms. We are on YouTube. We are on Spotify. We are on iTunes. Uh, if you didn't know, there's still Napster out there. We're still, on, we're on Napster, mm -hmm. um, Google Music, all the things, all the things. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys. You did a great show today. Thanks. I feel like I have my own personal concert. <laughs> we had so much fun. Thank you for having us. Thanks.
I'm a 